Hello everyone, I am Rajesh Isan Gupta and we will be uh, continuing uh, on our course on Indian art and today we will be going into our module 4 and week 4 and that is architecture 2. So we have already covered architecture 1 in which we have looked into the basics of Buddhist and Jain architecture and today we will be looking into Hinduism and temple building. So in module 4 or in the week 4, we will be looking into the details of Hindu idea of architecture as well as sculpture and so on and that sort of how that gives an idea between the deities, the devotees, the, the architecture, the spaces around us and the materials which are incorporated usually as part of worship. Now in terms of Hinduism there are certain characteristic features that we need to first get into and those are the things that how Hinduism does not really have one founding figure but there are multiple figures or multiple sources from which these ideas or these ways of life have emerged. So unlike the kind of uh, religions we have looked into for example Buddhism and Jainism we know from where they have started. For example, Buddhism have started, Buddhism has started from one particular person who is known as Gautama Buddha or Buddha the Shakyamuni and then for Jainism we have looked into a number of the Thankaras, there are 424 the Thankaras and the last one was um, the last person was um, a contemporary of uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. So unlike those we see that I mean in, in terms of the Hindu practices we do not really know that from where it started or if that had started from multiple sources at the same time and that is the reason we see from the very beginning there is multiplicity in the conception of Hinduism as well as the way the practices have been carried out. So from the very early beginning we, we see that there are many ways in which Hindu practices have evolved and in terms of the, the deities we find there are multiple deities who have been worshipped and so uh, based on the communities we find that some deities are preferred by certain communities whereas the other deities are preferred by the others and for these communities we find that whoever their, um, th their respected uh, deities are, they are considered to be the supreme energy in the universe. And that is perhaps one of the prime characteristics of Hinduism that we do not really see that there is only one way of being but there are multiple. And that is also something that adds to the ideas, that also something that adds to the way in which architecture and sculpture they have been modeled over time. Now after the Indus Valley period, if we see that what are the ways in which we have certain, certain evidences. So we see that after the Indus Valley period between 1500 BC and 500 BC, it seems like there have been um, this, this ideas about enshrining the deities, something that was not really been uh, there before that. So it can be imagined that I mean the absence of the, uh, the space specific Hindu deities in terms of their figurative expression or figurative um, idols or images that perhaps explains because that perhaps relates to the Vedic practices or the practices in each the uh, deities were evoked through um, the sacrificial fire and different kind of rituals which did not really require making images or making sculptures. So that kind of uh, abstracted practices in which we find in the, in the Vedic period which is understood as the post um, Indus Valley period. During this time we find that there are uh, practices where um, this sacrificial fire was created in this uh, square uh, yagna uh, or like I mean the places where, where this altars, the brick altars were made and in which yagna or the sacrificial rites were performed. So again we are going back to some of these ideas of brick and use of terracotta and perhaps those are also some of the reasons for which we do not really find substantial amount of evidences from these times. However, some of the um, literary uh, sources or some of the hymns of Vedas, they tell us about such kind of practices. Now 
as I have mentioned earlier that we find that between 1500 BC and 500 BC sometime during this time the idea of enshrining deities that had emerged in the Hindu practices and that is the uh, that is the character that sort of gave rise to making of temples. So, uh, during this time we also find I mean from the very early uh, times in Hinduism there have been a tendency towards worshipping nature and different forces of nature. So, for example, if we see the thunderbolt and thunderstorm and uh, then how those are related to the monsoon and then monsoon eventually relates to architecture and um, prosperity. So, those are the reasons we find that I mean thunderbolt becomes one of the um, a, a weapon or um, a particular um, attribute towards of uh, God Indra who's the, who was considered to be um, one of the prime gods during this uh, formative period of Hinduism. Now, apart from that we also find there are other deities for example, um, the, the sun god, the sun being the source of our lives. So, that is something that is a very important element of our lives and livelihood and everything else and that is the reason we find that sun god had also been very important part of um, you know the Hindu worships. Now, similarly we also find that there are uh, many other forces of nature for example, water and uh, many other things for example, air and so on. They have also been considered to be the deities or uh, how they have also been uh, worshipped by the people. Now, with that we see towards the end of this time period like as, a, as I have mentioned that between 1500 BC and 500 BC. So, towards end of this time period perhaps closer to 500 BC and so on there have been a rise of the three new gods and uh, they were considered to be this new Hindu trinity. So, they moved slightly away from the way the uh, god Indra the, um, the king of the gods the way they have been considered and now the Hindu trinity we find to be Shiva, Brahma and Vishnu. So, these three gods came to be considered as the Hindu trinity and they were related to the process of um, creation, sustainment and destruction. So, Brahma was the one who was considered to be um, related to creation whereas, Vishnu is the one who has been considered as the nourisher or sustainer and then we know as the god Shiva who is uh, related to the idea of destruction. And through this we also find that there is not really a linear flow of time which has been attributed here, but this is a cyclical flow. So, it starts from creation goes into sustainment and then to destruction, but destruction makes a way for um, this new creation and that is how this cycle of life and death continues. And that is also one of the reasons in which we find that in Hindu philosophy there is this idea about birth and rebirth which also responds corresponds to um, the, the formation of these deities and the overall philosophy which, which uh, shapes the Hindu ideas. Now, from there if we see, think about the evidences, the sculptural evidences or the architectural remains that we find from the very early times. So, some of the very early images that we find and which can be specifically attributed to the Hindu gods and goddesses, those will be perhaps the one we have on screen in the left side and that is the Shivalingam at Gudimalam in uh, the Chittur district of Andhra Pradesh. So, this is a replica of the uh, of the actual image that we have here and here what we find that in this particular image there is a vertically erect uh, male genitalia which is also called lingam and there there is the figure whom we find who holds a weapon in his left arm and uh, he, he also holds an animal in his right arm and then he stands on the top of a, a demon like figure uh, which, which was later on which could also be considered as, as the demon of uh, ignorance apasmara. So, uh, what we find here it is a very interesting kind of uh, amalgamation of the, um, the fertility related images 
at the same time how the symbolism of fertility and then uh, the, the role of the deities they come together in this image. So, there is a uh, there is not really a, um, an implicit but an explicit depiction of a male genitalia that we can find here and that is that is vertical and um, uh, and then in the in the body of this male genitalia we have the image of this person. So, this this person for its relationship to this uh, this lingam like shape. So, that is the reason he is considered to be uh, one of the early forms of God Shiva. And then if you also see the kind of railing that it uh, it surrounds the figure and this is there with this, this railing and this figure is kind of sunken in the, in the Garvagriha or the womb chamber of this temple in Gudimallam. And if you see the railing, the railing also follows something like this, this the post like I mean the, the bars and the column like uh, formation which we have already seen in the fencing of Sachi and Barut. So, this figure is considered this particular uh, this um, you know the, the Shiva Lingam at, at the at this temple of Gudimallam. This is considered to be built somewhere between 3rd century and 2nd century BC which comes very close to the period when the Bharat Stupa and later on the Sanchi Stupa was built. So, we can imagine that how certain ideas for example, the way in which this fencing has been made and if we also get into the details of the figure in which like the way the ornaments are depicted, the way the overall expression of the face and the body they have been constructed all of them bear high resemblance to the ones we have seen in Sanchi as well as in Bharat and so on. So, it is again a reminder for all of us to think that even though there are different religions we are talking about, but the artistic expressions are not distinct from each other. So, one religion would borrow from the other and there are always transactions and there are always exchanges between these religions that, that had happened in the past. So, if this is one of the one of the prime deities that we find how uh, some of the early figures of Lord Shiva had, had appeared in, in southern India. Then some of the other figures will be there for example, the one we have on the right side of the screen and this is a head of goddess Uma or goddess Durga who, who, who was and this, this particular this is a massive bust of goddess Uma or goddess Durga who, who which was found from Ghazni in Afghanistan. So, that also says something about how this uh, the religions and the identities were not really marked by the kind of um, the geographical places that we understand as the Indian subcontinent or the country of India today. Now, what we also find there and this, this particular figure the, the bust of goddess Uma that comes from perhaps 2nd century or 3rd century B, uh, AD. So, much later from the one which we have looked into in the slide in the left. However, we also see if we consider the kind of the style of making this figure and also like the way the hair has been made and then the eyes and of course, the ornaments and everything else they bear a high resemblance to the bodhisattva images that we have studied so far. And so, that, that also says something about this common aesthetic choices and the, um, the, the aesthetic decisions the, the sculptors and the artisans they have made during this, this, this time period at the same time in this regions which gave rise to this, um, this aesthetic quality of the Gandharan sculptures which persisted not only in one religion, but in many. Now, another important thing it might be that uh, sometime we, we do not have a particular time frame to, to suggest that I mean when it started, but we also see that I mean during uh, th this time perhaps in the first millennium BC or so on, we also see that how the the cult of the goddess or the, the worshippers of the goddess they, ha they have considered the goddess like for example, the goddess Durga or goddess Uma and so on, they to be the supreme power of the universe instead of Shiva, Vishnu and Brahma. So, that also gave rise to the tantric practices in which we find the supremacy of the goddess and not the gods. So, we have the Vedas and the Tantras both are simultaneously developing during these times.
From there, if we go a little further into the visual expressions and how uh, images were, were considered at the same time, how uh, these this expressions shaped the belief system in which we find that there are certain things which are much more abstracted. So, for example, if we start with the idea that uh, how in Hinduism the idea of the entire universe or the cosmos had been constructed. So, there is this idea of Brahmanda or this particular um, this Ramanda comes from this particular egg which is called Hiranya Garva and in which that there is a golden egg and from which we find that I mean that egg had exploded and then the entire creation had came into being. So, and this this particular explosion that, that we find there is something that is related to Brahma's did of creation. So, it expanded and that is how that how different different elements came into being and the multiplicity and the complexity of, of all the living beings and the non-living beings came into existence. So, that is how it has been constructed. Now, for those abstracted notions, we find that in Hindu visual culture or in Hindu art, there are both ways of um, expressions. So, if we consider the image in the left side of our screen, there is this abstracted Shiva Lingam and if we see the Shiva Lingam, there is this small linga or this male genitalia which has been depicted on this high pedestal. Now, this pedestal if we see it very closely, there is a square base for this lingam and the square base is a symbolic representation of the yoni or the female genitalia and it has been considered how prakriti or the female genitalia comes in uh, and then the union between prakriti and purusha and the purusha is something that is um, uh, symbolized by the male genitalia here. So, the union between them are integral to any acts of creation. So, that is something that we also find to be um, embedded in this in this abstracted formation of the Shiva Linga. If we think this is one abstracted expression of this really um, developed philosophy, on the other hand we also find expressions for example, we have a Mukhalingam and in which we find there is a uh, image of uh, Lord Shiva which is uh, which which is which is projected out of this uh, this abstracted linga shape and, and that comes from 5th century Mathura and uh, so in this one we see that I mean how there is a kind of an in between stage where the figurative representation of Shiva that comes in contact with the abstracted idea of a lingam. So, there are as I have already mentioned that there is not really one way of uh, looking into these images, but there are multiple ways and so that is the reason we find that high narrative expressions in Hindu art at the same time there can also be like highly abstracted expressions. So, both this things are possible. So, from there if we move little further to the kind of the structures and the architecture that the, those those are they mark the early stage of uh, the Hindu building practices and in which we find that again we are going back to some of the, um, the natural uh, structures of the living rock structures. So, for example, we find that there have been this idea about how this particular idea about enshrining the beloved deities or the deities whom we worship. So, to, to make a house for them. This is a particular idea that we find it is slightly different from or perhaps a bit different from the way we have seen in the Jain and in the Buddhist philosophy. So, in the structures in Buddhism and Jainism, we found that there was a prevalence towards uh, the, the structures such as monastery, viharas and chaityas like the places where people everyone gathers and they worship or like the monasteries which is predominantly used by the monks, the nuns and the ascetics. Here we find that there is a slightly different approach towards building a house for the gods and that is that there are two concepts coming together. The first one is there is a um, the house of the gods is something that is understood as um, the house which is which is inhabited by the high royals or the kings and the gods are the considered as the kings of the kings. Uh, so, that is the reason what we understand what we find here is that 
the structures which were erected or even the ones which are carved out of the rock shelters or the rock the living rock structures they all are been uh, considered to be a symbolic representation of a prasada or um, a palace like a complex then the other important part of of these temples we find in in terms of the architectural metaphors is this particular womb chamber now the womb chamber is the one that is uh, been understood and as all the lives they start from the mother's womb so the womb chamber is something that is considered to be the the most sacred space where the deity figures are installed and the womb chamber is usually uh, a dark a small space not re uh, where there will only be one entrance or one way to uh, go inside and it also does not really allow many people to go inside these places so really secluded really exclusive a space which is dark and which sort of evokes the sense of a womb so that is that is the womb chamber we find that is also something very in, important part of the hindu temples so as we i have said that i mean the the entire structure of the temple might also uh, resemble the the prasadas or the palace complexes but the main part or like i mean the part where the deity figures are installed that is something that is related to the mother's womb or the womb chamber which is also called in sanskrit as garbhagriha so what we find in some of the early examples the womb chamber like this particular uh, rock shelter like the formation that actually comes together with the actual um, the living rocks so for example as we have see here there is a cave temple here uh, in the in the left side of the screen and that is in udayagiri in madhya pradesh so in the earlier module or in the week we have already studied that udayagiri in the buddhist context and which comes from odisha but here we are looking into udayagiri which is uh, which is uh, from madhya pradesh and in madhya pradesh what we find here that there are this series of caves which were excavated during 4th to 5th century which is uh, which is also the time period of the guptas so which is which is considered to be uh, which, which has significantly contributed to to the making of indian art and architecture and during this time period we find how this sandstone caves were excavated and uh, so some of the examples for example the, the the one we see in the left side of the screen in which we find how this living rock structure had actually been carved in such a way that it resembles this temple like form the, the temples that we are uh, you know habituated most habituated to look at today and then there are um, the guardian figures towards the by the entrance gateway to the sanctum sanctorum and so there are some of this simple uh, formation of the temple that that we find that how this simple forms they started being called as the temple so the main uh, areas in a temple those will be the garbhagriha or the womb chamber and then it the entire structure resembles a, a prasada or a palace complex now how this prasada comes into being that that will be uh, discussing little more in the next image and from there i also wanted to show that how there are those the rock cut sculptures so the the architecture cannot really be separated from this rock cut sculptures because uh, there is not really a distinction there in in this uh, time period until 19th century we do not really see that kind of distinction so what we have here this is also a high relief in which the images are carved almost in three dimensional quality except for its back which is attached to the uh, the wall of this living rock structures and in this one we find that there is a the boar incarnation or the or the varaha incarnation of lord vishnu who's uh, represented in this particular image and uh, he is seen here to be rescuing the the bhu uh, devi or like i mean the earth goddess so this is something we find that i mean slowly how the temple structures that start uh, having this uh, this this uh, divisions in which like there is this seclus uh, this exclusive uh, this um, the womb chamber 
within which there is a dark chamber and there is not really uh, too many activities can happen inside it. And then there are other areas of this particular um, the temple complexes or areas where, where the devotees can see the great deeds of the gods. So, in one hand we have this highly figurative narrative expressions, on the other hand we have this very exclusive space only for the devotees to go there and um, you know it is uh, to perform their um, their homage or their or their uh, whatever rites in, in seclusion. So, these two things even though they seem like I mean these ideas are distinct from each other, but they are also performed side by side. The way I have already uh, explained that how Hinduism from the very beginning it thrived on the idea of multiplicity and not really like one way or the other, but many things at the same time. Now, from there if we get into the details about how the architectural spaces are constructed in, in this uh, particular um, you know in, in, in the as part of the Hindu temples, we find that uh, noted scholar Michael Meister had um, uh, elaborated on, on this issue and his analysis also had brought up some of the, um, some of the uh, ways in which the ground plans of these temples were laid out. And one of the very efficient ways in which to look at these ground plans will be to consider the idea of Vastu Purusha Mandala. And Vastu Purusha Mandala is the particular mandala or the ground plan that we have in the left side of the screen in which we find that there is this uh, square space which had been uh, you know divided in, in uh, many other squares and uh, usually there are um, I, I must say that there are uh, many um, opinions about whether the divisions are even or, or they are uneven. However, what we find that to be very important is in this, this particular um, in this Vastu Purusha Mandala in this particular ground plan, uh, there is one space which is uh, at the center which is considered to be the space which is dedicated to the Lord Brahma and Brahma is someone who is also uh, related to the act of creation. So, if we consider that this is a ground plan for any of the Garvagriha or the Sanctum Sanctum in which we can imagine that uh, in the, the central space which is kept for Lord Brahma that is the space in which the deities will be installed. And so, at the center of this Vastu Purusha Mandala which is also uh, a metaphor creation is the space where the deity figures are installed and worshipped by the, um, the devotees. And this also gives us a sense of how um, this, uh, this square ground plan for all this uh, for, for the uh, Garvagriha is, is something that, that is uniformly seen almost everywhere in the Hindu temples. I mean of course, I am excluding the contemporary Hindu temples, but mostly the ones which have um, you know which have followed the architectural treaties from the very early period, we find this particular um, ground plan had been implemented in most of these temples. We will be continuing on the vertical, um, the, the elevation of, of, of this structure in the next lecture. Thank you.